everyone. Welcome to our Lacuna like, Crucible for today. Um, just while we get started, I'd like you to all fill out that um, that survey below, which you'll be just popping up now. Let's have a look. Which is just me getting a sense of what state you're coming in from, basically. Um, <clears throat> quite often the crucible is a bit more mixed. I just took the Merchant Venice lecture that was majority in New South Wales. Uh, but I just want to get a sense of where you guys are coming in from. Uh, where are you tuning in from? The reason for asking this isn't because it's necessarily going to um, affect what I uh, say. Um, the reason is just because in New South Wales, obviously, this has a specific unit title, Text and Human Experiences. And in Victoria, my understanding is that you guys do a comparative study with this text, uh, with the dressmaker. Um, my goal here is to provide a really good overview in a holistic sense. So it's not going to be New South Wales or, Queen, uh, or Victoria specific, um, but it, sorry, I didn't press play on the poll. Um, but it, I, at points, I will jump in with a bit about text and human experiences. Probably not as much about uh, the dressmaker, just because I really don't know anything about it. Uh, the last time I took this lecture, I was talking a bunch about the movie, and then I realised that there was also a book. <laughs> I can talk briefly about it, but not a whole heap, basically. Um, uh, it looks like we've still got majority New South Wales here, and a couple of WA, which is pretty cool. Um, a nice, diverse list. So, welcome. As I said, this is our Crucible lecture today, uh, but before we get into that, I might introduce myself. My name is Bella. I graduated three years ago in 2019, um, and I study PPE and law at UNSW. So if you have any questions uh, about uni stuff as well, uh, you are more than welcome to ask too. Uh, the other fun fact, I can probably turn the, take this slide off now. I don't have to have it all the time. Um, but I like to put this up there, is I have actually been to Salem. It was very fun. I went in the middle of year 12, which really added to it. Uh, I was at a competition in a different part of Massachusetts. So uh, my mum and I flew into Boston and then I was kind of like, oh, we kind of have to go, don't we? Like, come on. Um, so that was a really fun experience to have uh, while I was technically studying it. So I liked being able to be like, oh, I know that name. I know that name. Um, so that's pretty cool. Um, but yeah, that does in fact mean that all of this stuff was real. Uh, to an extent, Arthur Miller has edited some, edited some things quite significantly, um, but it is kind of fun to think of in that regard. Um, it is, as a result, a kind of common historical event that Miller has then projected his opinions, thoughts, messaging on, uh, which we'll get to that in a bit about like why he's done that, what that means, what he's trying to say. Um, but for now, let me give you a a rundown of the lecture ahead. So it's a two hour lecture, roughly these blocks will be about 50 minutes each. Um, if you see me looking down, I feel like just pointing out, I am looking at, um, uh, I am looking at the poll of the questions. So I should actually go into that first as well. So today on your screen, you can see me and the slides there um, on your screen. So that's happening live. Uh, below that, you should see a couple of things. One thing is a poll and a QA. and a uh, You guys are doing the poll right now, which is fantastic. Uh, it's mostly New South Wales, but a solid amount of Victoria and all the Queensland and WA as well, um, which is great. Uh, it's good to know that. Um, but other than the poll, you should also see a little Q&A box. That is how we'll be communicating, so I can see your Q&As. Um, Um, which I've just accepted them all, which they've gone up and into the live section. So if you see a question you like, given an upvote, um, that puts it to the top so I can see what's going on, basically. Um, that's how we'll be communicating. I know it's a bit weird sometimes with like online, but this is a good way because you can ask as many questions as you want and you can be anonymous. Though, to be clear, you can't use that, abuse that anonymity, anonymity because I can kick you kick you off the chat, um, so don't do anything bad. Um, but in the meantime, we'll just discuss what we're going to do for this lecture. Um, as I said, roughly 50 minute halves each, um, so that we have time for 
um, both uh, some questions at the end or in the middle and also for me to have a break. So this is my second lecture of three today. Um, I'm imagining that at about two o'clock ish, as you can hear my voice is already not the most pleasant thing. I have to be loud, which makes it worse. <laughs> um, so I, at about, you know, two ish, I'm going to stop for a five, 10 minute break and sip some water and stop talking, uh, which will be very good for you guys. Um, but you can also see, I think I mentioned it, but I just want to check that the Q and A box, you should also be able to see the slides for download. Um, I will be talking off the slides. The slides do have content on them, but the reason they're uploaded is so you don't have to worry about taking down every single note on the slides. What's more important is listening to me and the stuff that I might say on a bit of a tangent. Uh, the Crucible was my favorite text I studied in year 12, and quite frankly, I think my favorite text will stop throughout all of uh, high school English. Yeah, probably. Yeah, I think so. Um, uh, the reason for that is I think it's a really interesting text just in terms of where it's at Histori historically, um, the context it's written in. I think um, I think the big thing for me is it's just really interesting the way Miller's interpreted a historical event. It gets some really great um, analysis beside it. It's uh, kind of fun to write about, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, you're getting the sense that maybe I'm a bit of a nerd and that's okay. Um, so in our first block, we're kind of splitting it up into a bit of an overview block and an analytical block. So block one is all about uh, what actually happens. Uh, what is our context? Um, what's going on? Why does Miller matter? What's going on within the text? What is the rough plot summary? Um, because I know some of you, well, most of you in New South Wales have read it in term four. So maybe you've forgotten a little bit if you did read it, which some of you may not have. Um, if you're in Victoria, you'll be starting fresh, so you may not have a, you may, hopefully you've read it, but if you haven't, that's all good. Um, it's not a hard text to read, to be clear, um, but you do need to read it. So we're going to give a bit of a plot overview, I'm going to point out some of the key moments, um, and then we'll go into a bit of a character analysis. And I say character analysis there, but it's going to be a bit more of an overview. Uh, I'm going through a bunch of characters, I will obviously spend more time on the main ones, like Proctor and Abigail. Um, but I'm going to give you a really good overview. Um, block two, as I said, is more analytical, uh, analytically driven. So we're going to look at themes, language and form features, and then we're going to look at some essay questions, not essay questions, essay examples, which brings me to my second point. So as I said, majority New South Wales, but a solid amount from Queensland and a good amount from Victoria. Um, I'm going to say, what year are you guys in? Just so I think the majority of you will be in year 12. But I just want to get a sense of that. Uh, just so I can give you guys a warning about um, when we get to those example paragraphs, they're a bit of it. They're um, what I wrote during trials of year 12. Um, now, in fairness, they were my time trial essay, so there's not 100% perfect. I was looking back on them because I had to use them for something else, and I was going, God, I was so pretentious when I wrote. Um, but it is a good indication of, say, what a 20 out of 20 at your HSC will look like. Um, so something to aspire to, not necessarily something you have to be able to do right now. But we are majority sitting at year 12, which is cool. Um, so. Let's jump straight into it with our uh, more overview block of block one, which will include a context and a plot summary. Uh, the context is really, really, really key to the crucible. I can't express that enough. Um, primarily because there are two layers of context. We have the actual, his mm, two or three, two and a half, I'd say. We have the actual historical context of what Miller is trying to mi mirror. We have the... Uh, maybe slightly exaggerated context of his depiction of Salem, and we have his own individual context. Uh, we also have a modern context from us as contemporary responders, uh, which is quite interesting, and I might put up a chat just to see if anyone has any thoughts on that. Um, so, yeah, let's get into context. We're going to start with Miller. Um, so... It was published in 1953, which is at the right relatively at the start of the Cold War when things are, I would say, heating up, but that's a bit ironic, right? So it's not like peak of the peak, um, Cuban Missile Crisis, the world is going to end, 
but this is when things are really starting to get tense. Uh, the illusion of, hey, we just like sold World War II together, yay, is gone. Um, at this point is a time period uh, that was really fostered called the Red Scare. Americans were terrified of the innate threat of communism um, and everything could be seen as being aligning you with the communist, right? Uh, for Miller, who was a progressive-ish, or at least moved in progressive circles, this was a big deal. Uh, because, you know, if you're talking to people in unions or... Sorry, I can't let you. Sorry. Uh, if you're talking to people in unions or you're hanging out with people who are lefties, especially with, um, you know, especially in Hollywood, you know, they're obviously, you know, there's dirty Hollywood lefties, right? They're probably all communists, hey? Um, so the Red Scare would not just affect him from a, I guess, creative perspective and a national perspective, but it's also going to impact his colleagues and him personally. Um, the reason for this period is there was a senator that held a lot of power called Joseph McCarthy, which is where that phrase McCarthyism comes from. Um, if you've heard of it and is present in my meme, that's unfortunately outdated because Among Us isn't a thing anymore, and thank God. Um... He was very firmly on the forefront of getting rid of the communists. Everything communist was a threat to America. Anyone that had any suggestion of being communist was a threat to America and less determined otherwise. Um, so that is the social period that Miller is writing in. It's problematic, right? He's not having... It's not a good social time. He then noticed this, this comparison that it's almost like people are being deemed to be criminals or deemed to be communists without any evidence in order to stamp out some type of transgression in society. Uh, and that gets him thinking about when else this has happened because it was seen as a relatively unprecedented time. Uh, we've moved from an America that during the war was relatively united and obviously that's a caveat with, you know, white Americans are relatively united. Um, and this is rapidly changing due to people who hold a lot of power. Um, McCartney, uh, McCarthy, not McCartney, hey? I've, that's the first time I've noticed this type of... Um, is, he is going to rapidly lose popularity in the next couple of years, um, which is good. But there is still a social red scare that goes on. There was a bit of a red scare in Australia as well. I'm sure you guys have all seen the various propaganda posters that worried about dominoes and etc, etc. Uh, the other, from a personal contextual perspective, that's Miller's social context. Remember when we're looking at texts and context, there are four types of context. We have social, we have political, we have uh, literary slash cultural, and we have personal. Uh, in terms of this, this is a bit social and political context, the Red Scare, McCarthyism, etc. like that. Um, so it's a bit of a mix there. Often those conte contextual bubbles, if you can think of them, overlap quite strongly. But from Miller's personal uh, contextual perspective, other than the fact his colleagues would be directly involved and as would he, um, is that a lot of people believe, or it's some, maybe not a lot, but it is thought that in a way the crucible was also for Miller to justify uh, the fact he had an affair while he was married. Uh, his marriage that would collapse, but that he was kind of going, oh, you know, maybe, uh, you know, it's not that bad type thing. Um, which brings an interesting spin to Miller as an individual for what is a relatively progressive text, but we're going to get into, well, relatively progressive for its time. Uh, in terms of taking on kind of ideology, but from a modern perspective, looking back, especially when looking at gender, not so much. Um, the historical context of the play is also very important. Um, it is set in a pure American colony. Uh, Puritans that had moved to England are uh, moved from England due to intolerance. Uh, so they had already um, been subject to discrimination themselves, but they needed to create their own society that was built on them being together. Um, the significance of picking a pure American colony is interesting here. It's like true blue, and true blue is an Australian term, obviously, um, American, you know, the original settlers, you know, ho home of America, etc, etc, Massachusetts, right? 
Um, this is meant to be America in a nutshell, which is really essential um, for how the rest of the play goes on and what Miller is trying to say. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the events in the text did technically happen. Um, it, uh, it is set during the Salem Witch Trials in Massachusetts. Uh, so the Witch Trials did ex eventually expand, but Salem was seen as kind of the crucible for it. Uh, the uh, changes that were made, um, the affair line, obviously, because uh, Abigail in real life was about, I don't remember if she was 12 or 9, but very young, a child, basically. Uh, the other thing is they now suspect things like they don't 100% know what happened uh, during the witch trials as to why all of a sudden there was this hysteria. Uh, they think it could have been as simple as the water was infected with a kind of fungus that basically made people um, high and they couldn't understand things. So there are varying theories. Um, it's not 100% historically set, but it is one of the great examples of a mass hysteria. Um, as I said, this arose out of intolerance from England, Puritan society, leaving, running away, trying to find fresh land. In this belief system, women were seen as inherently sinful um, because obviously Eve, you know, if you, if you study Christianity at any point, you get that connection. But in general, women were seen as equal, but lesser, if that makes sense. Um, they had rights, but they weren't necessarily to be trusted. I mean, had rights is in apostrophes there, but they weren't to be trusted, you know? Uh, they were seen as being open to manipulation by the devil. That was the innate female weakness or whatever. Um, education as well was uh, paramount, normally through a religious lens. So if you think about all the kind of big schools in America, uh, in, you know, Harvard, Brown, Another one which you can't remember, they were all founded by kind of religious groups initially. Um, normally that education will be through the lens of faith, but education, regardless, for men, was very important. Which is another mirror to Miller's own context, whereby in the 50s, more the 60s, but you start to see this mass awakening of the, uh, of the population due to more easy access to education, university, things like that. Um, now, of course, there is the issue of what is the modern relevance of the crucible. Um, this is a bit contentious because some people will have different feelings. So I'm going to chuck it open to you just to get some discussion happening. Watch. Just to get some discussion happening about what you think the modern relevance of the crucible is. Is there a... Uh, necessarily a uh, time period that you can see another link to other than the Red Scare. Um, there are a lot of hot takes about this. Obviously this is a joke tweet about, you know, do you want to know who else got cancelled? <laughs> um, but I've done some reading on this. Um, my teacher gave it to me in year 12. She gave it to everyone, but you know, I read it um, about the uh, kind of not quite mass hysteria. Uh, and I don't know, maybe some people would deem it that. Um, but the kind of witch trials in the wake of, say, 9-11 in America um, about un-Americanism, again, a similar thing about who doesn't fit into society or with us or against us type rhetoric. Um, I have seen discussions which I don't necessarily agree with um, about, say, Me Too and uh, more broadly cancellation, which again is... Again, I don't necessarily agree with that. I think that's people trying to use a text in the same way people be like, this is just like 1984 when they've never read it. Um, but it is an interesting thing, right? Um, as people are saying, you know, applicable to modern times, the an anonymity of the um, internet has led to spreading misinformation and a host of other things. Absolutely. Um... In terms of that as well, like bubbles that pick up and the mass mentalities and stuff like that. So yeah, um, so we've got some ideas about COVID and stuff like that. I think that's can be similar. Um, honestly, I don't know. Sorry, that's okay. Um, yeah, so there are lots of things flying around. So this is a societal thing, as people are saying, like scaremongering downfalls of humanity, pressing people because they're different. And obviously different countries will have a different, you know, depending on the context you're looking at. Um, it can be different sometimes, right? Um, but it is an interesting thing to think about. I think thinking about um, why we bother studying this and if it holds any relevance is really important, right? Um, 
it allows you to build that connection with the text and have a care for the text basically. Um, because effectively what the crucible is warning against is, so someone I think asked what's, um, is, uh, some people with the, ooh, hang on. um, some people what they've, uh, oh, sorry, I've lost my train of thought, I was trying to do something. Some people, uh, someone asked, um, what a mass hysteria is. So that's when there is a fear in society that kind of builds and gets a bit, in, uh, a bit over the top. So. You can Google like famous instances of mass hysteria. It's called like a social illness, basically, um, where people kind of freak out and then everyone's kind of affected with it. Um, sometimes it's like silly things like um, like a dancing mania where everyone starts dancing and no one can stop. Um, but there are other things about um, in uh, there was a very if not famous but famous ish example of. Um, of a mass hysteria to do with like the satanic panic in the 70s and 80s which is kind of similar um, about this notion of uh, f making something a problem that really builds and then all of society believes it so it's important to um, lots of toilet paper during COVID yay you're right um, absolutely um, things like that so it's really important to see why do we still study this it's obviously a warning against buying into some type of ideology that can destroy society and someone pointed out um like both sides basically of the COVID debate about pro or anti-vax um and the kind of mob mentality of it and i think that's a good way to look at it M M miller is warning against that kind of um mob mentality type thing in the purest sense basically um so moving on to a bit of a plot summary. Um, the simplest description is, I'm going to move on the air and then we'll go through it, is that basically Salem has an ideology that punishes anyone that transgresses from the norm. Transgressing is redefined so that Salem's ideology will punish anyone that transgresses from the norm, even if that norm has become no longer the norm, basically. So think about the people being punished for just sort of like standing up to, um, standing up and saying, hey, no, they're my friend, they're not a bad person. Oh, well, they're obviously in league with the devil, right? So the short and long, to an extent, is this. Abigail is caught transgressing from the town's uh, social norms, basically. So she's caught dancing, um, which kind of devolves into something else about, you know, summering witches and stuff like that. Um, but the short is that Abigail basically is caught doing something she's not meant to do. She is terrified because she already has very little power in this society. So she turns around and realizes that, hang on, no, 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 I wasn't like making a pact with the devil. I was forced to. So she blames her uncle's slave, Tichaba. Um, the interesting thing there, obviously, to note is Abigail is already of, I guess, less social importance being a young woman who's done something wrong there aren't many people that she can put that blame on so she goes another rung lower of a slave um this is believed by the town uh because they this is a tenant of their ideology and they think they're being tested in some way um in order to defend herself tichaba it kind of agrees and says, yeah, I've been, you know, consorting with the devil. I don't want to, but he says I have to kind of thing. Uh, and then when Abigail to an extent realizes, oh, okay, Tichib is weaving a story here. She turns around and all women and girls claim that they've seen someone with the devil. They've seen someone else with the devil and it's rapidly escalated. In order to try and gain some one control, but two, punish people who are consorting with the devil, a court is set up in order to be conviction. However, the problem with that is that you can't really have evidence of possessions. Um, and that's another issue we'll get to in a second. Um, but in an effort to quell the concern that we're, the society is worried they have a rapidly growing strain of like witchcraft-itis, um, anyone else who seems sympathetic must also be a witch, obviously, because why would you ever align yourself to these witches? Because they are witches. Like, it's not like something they could be making up. 
So then the punishment keeps growing. The town falls into absolute chaos as the lower social classes or the socially less important people continue to be punished. Slowly they run out of people, so they need to keep going up the social ranking. Important people start being convicted. People that have always been seen as good and proper. So the town is falling into chaos. Uh, it spreads to other towns. And Abigail realises what's happened and what she's kind of caused. And she gets out. Uh, she flees taking money. And by the end of the play, basically all the virtuous characters are gone. Um, entirely. Uh, they're either dead or they're in jail or something. Uh, Abigail's left and we only have the warning line from Miller about the theocracy in Massachusetts for all intents and purposes. For all intents and purposes, the power of the theocracy in Massachusetts was broken. Um, so, as I said, the too long didn't read of that is Salem has a very rigid ideology. And that ideology kind of bites them in the end because they need to keep punishing people. It's like an unraveling raveling thread that they can't stop, basically. So, that's the gist. Um, obviously, oversimplified, there's other stuff that goes on. I didn't mention anything about, like, John Proctor and Abigail and their whole affair. Um, and I haven't mentioned the characters yet, right? Uh, that's okay. That's, you may, they're the main events, basically. That's what I wanted to summarise. Uh, you may... Not talk about all those events, obviously. As with the characters we're going to go over, there's a lot. And we may not, you may not, um, and you may not actually talk about all these characters. So my goal is to give you the overview in this section and then we're going to dig a bit deeper. I mean, we're going to start to dig a bit for the characters. As I said, we're going to look at a heap of characters today. Um, none of you from New South Wales would have tuned into my um, Merchant of Venice lecture because obviously those two uh, texts contradict. They're both human experiences. I had six characters for that one. Not for this one. We're going to go all out. I'm, I'm analysing every single character for you guys today. Um, but we will get into it and will hopefully allow you to be a bit more of a have a bit more of a holistic view of the text. So, as I said, you may not ever analyse Rebecca Nurse in the text, um, but it's important to know, say, her role. And same thing with, like, Elizabeth Proctor. You all know her role, but it's important to talk about it as well. We're going to start with John Proctor. Um, our protagonist of the text, but not necessarily a good person. He's a flawed individual. Um... He is seen as basically the everyman. He's not perfect. Uh, you know, he doesn't go to church. Back in the day, that was a pretty big deal. Um, he is more a normal person and how a normal individual can be kind of taken over and consumed by society and his goodness can be consumed. Um, he acts largely in self-interest. He's introduced as basically a gruff guy that's like, okay... Like, that's my line. Like, he's introduced not as the most friendliest fella. Um, he is largely portrayed as a man of integrity, however. He doesn't want to give up his friends. He doesn't go along with the witchcraft thing because he knows it's not a thing. Um, he is effectively shown to be a good man. Is probably I know that's a very simple description, but I think it's probably the most accurate, right? Um... Here is the interesting thing, though, obviously, and this is where I think the relevance of Miller's text is degraded a bit, is that, obviously, described as a man of integrity and everyone's like, oh, he's such a good guy, did have an affair with a 17-year-old um, and then is, like, mean to his wife about the fact he had an affair. So that portrayal maybe doesn't hold up, right? His integrity to his values doesn't entirely extend to Elizabeth, though obviously as the text progresses, he's willing to kind of do anything for her. Um, and in fact, is willing to say to the town, um, he did have an affair and it needs to all end. Um, the irony obviously being that Elizabeth doesn't understand what he's trying to do at that point. Um, 
he's seen as a bit of a stand in for Miller. So someone has asked that, could John Proctor be a reflection of Miller himself? An excellent question. A lot of people argue that. So one, because of the affair thing. Uh, two, because of the... Uh, now, Miller obviously thinks very highly of himself in this case. The role that Proctor plays in um, not putting an end to the trials, because he obviously doesn't, but the role he plays within the text of refusing to capitulate. Um, he's almost portrayed as a Christ-like figure. Uh, willing to sacrifice himself for the good of the town um, and, you know, moving beyond, you know, being so forgiving and all this kind of stuff, willing to do anything um, for his wife or to save his name and this kind of stuff, right? Um, this is a really interesting thing because obviously we have the normal issue of quite often authors will make themselves to be the protagonist of their text. Uh, it's a relatively common self-insert thing. Um, we then add in a couple more characteristics for Miller and you go, okay, like you've got a very healthy ego, King. The interesting thing from a storytelling perspective is that we obviously have Proctor at the very end do that whole not quite soliloquy, but, you know, monologue where he talks about, it's my name, I only have one, you can do anything to me, please don't take my name. Um, and also him refusing to then pass on names, right? He refuses to say, yes, I was engaged in witchcraft, I was possessed by so-and-so. Um, he refuses to kind of delve to that level. This is an interesting aspect of his character because it is exactly what Miller does later. Not before the text. It's actually a, a case of Miller um, taking inspiration from himself. I'm not sure. When Miller is hauled up to the HUAC Committee, i.e. the House of Un-American Affairs Committee, or the House Amer Un-American Affairs Committee, i.e. in front of the House of Representatives in the US, or the committee from the House, um, who say to him, you know, you've been implicated. Uh, someone said that you're probably a communist. Uh, give us the names. Uh, we won't prosecute you or the punishment will be lighter uh, if you say who got you in league with the commies um, and then you can go. Now, by this point, this was a really big deal. Uh, he was with Marilyn Monroe, so it wasn't exactly a quiet affair being hauled in front of the government and forced to confess. Um, but he refused to give names. He refused to pass on anyone who may have um, been in league with the communists. And obviously a lot of the names given were not people in league with the communists. They were people who happened to have maybe a tangential connection with someone leftist. Um, and they people would name them because they were scared. Because it was this issue of you've committed a crime against the state, we'll investigate you, we'll put you in jail for treason, etc, etc. Um, or you can tell us five names and then, you know, we'll be good. So almost like those pyramid, not quite pyramid scheme, but you know, um, you, one person has to do five people and then those five people have to do five more people. Um, it's not going to work out well in the end, but Miller kind of took a stand and ha took, copped it himself basically. Um, so an interesting character, uh, characterization and a, I'm sorry, just A very interesting characterization, in short. Um, but you don't necessarily have to bring all of that up in an essay, right? All of that in really niche information isn't maybe going to be relevant. The representation aspect, and that's that key word for those in New South Wales, um, about Miller kind of being a stand-in for... Uh, sorry, Proctor being a stand-in for Miller in terms of his society is relevant. The little really niche bits about not giving names and blah, blah, blah. Not so much. They are still contextual flair, though, that you can add. Abigail is an interesting character in that she's in very complex. And I think an opinion of her complexity or an understanding of her complexity has changed significantly over time. When she's introduced in the text, she's introduced as, you know, a manipulator and a liar and she's hiding something immediately you know a master dissembler um or oh, i can't remember the exact phrasing but you know she is not to be trusted 
Um, she... So for people, especially in the 50s and 60s, that saw this, yeah, she's bad. She causes all the chaos. Um, I think it is interesting to note how distinct and how... How indistinct, rather, Abigail's gender and sexuality is from her character. She really doesn't get any kind of extra characterization. She's an evil, lying, conniving woman. Um, so what you want to do is look beyond that and look at potentially what Miller is maybe saying, but also imbue that into your own thoughts about Abigail. Um, that she is trapped within her historical identity, that she is still a bad person, but she is attempting to become less oppressed within Salem. Now, that ideological manipulation she takes, uh, she completes when doing, you know, dealing with, you know, moving her dancing and then teacher bar and blah, blah, blah. It's all done to protect herself ultimately. Um, she doesn't want to get in trouble for dancing. Uh, she doesn't want Tipchaba to kind of have more power than her. Uh, she continues to protect herself as she creates more victims and the girls fully believe her. Um, and then finally when she leaves the town, she has created all this chaos for an innately selfish reason. Um, as I mentioned, her, character is, her characterization is very based around her gender and sexuality, which is not something I think a 1950s Arthur Miller really handled very well. That's probably when I was saying the beginning, uh, in terms of the progressiveness of her te of the text, maybe not. Um, so your job as English students is to turn around and go, actually, um, we're not just going to talk about, you know, Abigail's a really evil person. We're not going to also make up that Miller's trying to, like, say girl power here. But Miller is probably still highlighting the fact that people in repressed societies will feel like they're going to explode at a point. That's what happened to Abigail. She was repressed. She used a rigid ideology to her advantage and created chaos. That's not necessarily Abigail's fault. Um, it is kind of the society's Without the society being the way it is, it wouldn't have happened, basically. Reverend Paris, uh, i.e. Abigail's uncle, is a deeply selfish uh, character. He is meant to be a very clear contrast to Proctor. He's a representation of hypocrisy as well, and, the, and more importantly, the hypocrisy of ideology. Um, his role, while meant to be, uh, you know, the religious kind of guider, um, is unfortunately blinded by the fact he cares and relies on his reputation. He has to have the support of the town, otherwise he will not have a job. So he can't, you know, turn around and go, well, you know, actually, maybe I don't believe in this witchcraft nonsense. Um... And in fact, that is kind of how it kicks off. He says to Abigail, you know, I can't be soft on you, you know, you, you will have to be correctly punished, um, which kind of kicks the whole thing off. He's not a good person, but at the same time, especially at the end, I think when, you know, Abigail's run off with his money, he seems to be a deeply broken man. So he probably did believe in his ideology wholeheartedly, but unfortunately, he let that blind him from the truth, which is to care and protect. Um, and we'll get to that in a bit. I'll have an uh, example analysis. But, you know, the famous line is, uh, my ministry it's, is at stake and so is your cousin's life, i.e. his daughter's life. So the fact he felt the need to say, hey, I'm going to lose my job here before he said, also, my daughter might die is very telling. Proctor is meant to be, sorry, Proctor, not the Proctor, but Mrs. Proctor, Elizabeth Proctor, is meant to be a contrast to Abigail. She, this is again where our bit of gender comes in, in a bit of an unpleasant way, because she is meant to be the ideal woman. She's loyal to John despite all his faults, wants to protect him in the end, even though she could give him up and save them all. She wants to protect his reputation. And she's also one of the very few characters, full stop, but particularly women, that despite being accused, she doesn't lash out, she doesn't blame someone else, other than obviously, you know, Abigail. 
Um, so she's meant to be that contrast. She's a more of a gender contrast. Now, obviously, there's a question to be had about whether uh, that's, again, a matter of circumstance. Elizabeth is living a okay-ish life. You know, she's got a husband. She's got um, a house. You know, that kind of stuff. It's not that bad, right? But this is kind of the contrast. She doesn't play a massive role, but she does play a big part of John's motivations um, rather than necessarily being an active member of the cast herself. Reverend Hale is a contrast in this regard to Paris. And as you can see, there's a lot of contrasting characters here. The reason for that is Miller is building a very um, diverse and complex cast of characters basically he doesn't want people like this is clearly the good person this is clearly the bad person um Hale is not a good person right we see that he um he still goes along with it he's an academic but he wants to you know he's like oh yeah witchcraft I've seen this before it's probably witchcraft but instead of actually going hey let's focus this differently He's seen as a man of whole faith. Rather than Paris, who is about reputation first and faith second, Hale doesn't care what he has to do to make sure he's following things correctly. Uh, unfortunately, he has a very circular interpretation of the problem at hand, i.e. something bad is happening, therefore it must be witches. Um, or people are saying there's witchcraft, therefore they must be witchcraft. Um, however, he does ultimately advocate for those he believes uh, are wrongfully accused and demonstrates a very early form of separation of church and state. He doesn't believe that religious whim should control uh, the courts. He steps back a bit. Uh, however, at the end, in the same way that Paris is broken, uh, Hale is just defeated. He's disillusioned. He's given up on what's going on because he thinks he, he almost, there is a sense of acknowledgement for everything he's done. Um, at the end, we obviously have him trying to negotiate with John Proctor saying, you know, just don't, just, it's okay. Say it, we'll get rid of, like, say you're guilty. We won't put it anywhere. You know, that type of thing. He just wants the saga to be over with, basically. So he's a good character to analyze in that regard. Um, Judge Danforth and Giles Corey are two very different characters, but very interesting. Corey is introduced as a nuisance, right? He's seen as like, he's angry, he's like getting mad at John Proctor for his land and Proctor really responds with like, it's Jill man, like who cares? Um, which gives us our first indication of John Proctor maybe being a good person. He doesn't care about grudges, right? Um, he ultimately, Giles Corey, is believed, is seen as a man who believes in the integrity of the legal system, right? He isn't hung. He is interrogated to his death. He will not bow. Um, yet, he's also a very tragic case, right? He is the reason his wife is accused because he's saying, you know, she's reading funny books. Like, that's weird. Women don't read. Um, and if he had been, he obviously didn't mean maliciously by it, but had he not said anything, it's doubtful he or his wife would have died in the way they did. Um, Judge Danforth is a warning against mixing the law and religion because he is a uh, judge, but he is also pursuing God's will. And again, using kind of circular knowledge, uh, circular reasoning about, well, the girl's possessed, therefore someone's a witch. Um, Miller ultimately through him critiques this notion of like, you're either innocent or you're not, you're with us, you're contributing or you're not, um, and highlights that ideology and politics shouldn't mix. Um, Hale comes to some guilt in that he does turn around he doesn't want proctor to die uh danforth is very clear he wants he thinks proctor should die because he is guilty um the danforth is also intended to represent uh the court system and the kind of house in terms of putting people following ironclad what the government wants what the american ideology says and not really thinking twice about it 
Uh, Rebecca Nurse is the symbol of goodness in the community. Another one. A pure goodness. Uh, she's religious. She's well respected. She's a good person. She is not, um, as they say in the text at a point, they talk about, you know, initially it was just kind of the riffraff that were being accused and everyone was fine with it. Then it was, um, as the hysteria continues to build, Rebecca Nurse is caught up in it, despite being just a good old woman. Um, she is kind of seen and used, her death is used to demonstrate that the town is almost too far gone. Um, she falls victim to the hysteria, despite being incredibly well respected. Um, Thomas Putnam, however, is purely driven by self-interest. Uh, he wants land. Uh, because if people are put to death, he gets to get the land. Um, he is, as I said, inherently selfish and acts in a way to protect himself. So a lot of the accusations come from him. He accuses people to gain something. Um, but he still acts as a bit of commentary, not just on like how bad people will do bad things, but how in societies that are really repressive can often bubble over into minor grievances becoming major grievances. If they just like ha Putnam was able to have a chat with people, a lot of these issues would not have occurred. Oh, pardon me, everyone. Um, Anne Putnam, Thomas's wife, is motivated by fear and sadness. Um, she avoids accusation despite objectively having a connection with the devil. Um, in terms of using Tichaber to like do a little seance. Um, she avoids accusation entirely. She turns it onto other people. She puts blame out. So she's a great example of um, someone seeking solace in a transgressive ideology. In this case, you know, witchcraft, uh, communism, whatever. And her going, no, 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 no. It was them, it was them, it was them. A very common kind of story. Um, Mary Warren and the girls are an interesting character set because they're not super diverse and they're not super complex, but they are a really interesting character group. Miller is really vim. He thinks they're unpleasant, they're subservient, they're weak, they're naive, they're fat. You know, he gives them all these incredibly negative adjectives. And as a result, he teases it out that... As a result, these girls are willing to do anything for a sense of connection. Much like, much like Avangale, they're largely marginalised in the town. They're young women, um, in this case lower class or un unattractive young women, who are willing to do anything to have a connection and more importantly have a sense of power within society. Um, Mary herself, by the end of the play, is more motivated purely by fear. Um, changing her alliance from Abigail to John to back to Abigail in order to save herself. Uh, she has the opportunity to do the right thing uh, and save lives and end a lot of carnage, but she chooses not to. Uh, and while it's easy to blame her as an individual for this, it's also important to note that she is terrified of losing that power and being on the end of it, basically. That scene where uh you know mary's trying to get them to stop and abigail and all the girls are just mimicking her and saying mary stop controlling the bird or whatever it is um is meant to be you know it's a very literal representation of her saying something and no one listening right her feeling that lack of power and everyone turning on her again is enough to motivate her to go back with the girls okay um okay now we're going to move into block two, which is our more analytical block. So let's get started. We're going to go through six key themes here. Hysteria and fear, power, religion and ideology, intolerance, reputation, gender, class and agency. Um, in your essay, you'll probably have, if you're not doing comparative, I know Victoria does comparative, Victoria will probably be doing two body paragraphs with a shared type of theme. Uh, probably intolerance and reputation, maybe, or intolerance and gender class agency, something like that. 
If you're in New South Wales or I imagine Queensland, you'll be aiming for three body paragraphs. Maybe four if you can push it, but three is a solid amount for now. Um, so I'm giving you some spare, right? Again, not I mean, Victoria, you wouldn't have started the year, not sure about Queensland. In New South Wales, you would have probably done, you may not have, um, done a task in term four that may have been a multimodal, a speech, something like that. You maybe had to write a mini essay, hey? Uh, which meant that you only maybe wrote about 600 words, which kind of is a bit annoying when you're trying to actually flesh out an essay plan. As a result, you may have uh, gone back to writing a character essay based essay. One paragraph on John Proctor, one paragraph on Abigail type thing. Um, hang on. Um, you may have done that, character paragraphs, right? Um, however, while that's okay, it's not the best method to do. The reason for that is twofold. One, the themes in this text are very, very rich. You want to have that deep understanding. Um, two is for a practical purpose. You're going to bring up John Proctor more than once, like more than three times. You want to do more than three quotes about John Proctor. Um, if you do a par character paragraph, that's a bit hard to say, um, you can't bring him up lots and lots because he's outside of his paragraph, right? And same with Abigail for that matter. You want to be united on themes because that allows you to talk about what you would like without sacrificing an order. And because these themes are interwoven throughout the text, it allows you to kind of talk about different aspects, almost like a chronological order. Okay, let's start with hysteria and fear. Hysteria is basically the key, like it's known as an event of basically mass hysteria, right? It is the key aspect. Um, it's an essential theme in reflecting the scare within not just the text, but in Miller's own time, right? Um, without a hysteria and a fear of, um, you know, the devil and society and stuff like that, the event, the text doesn't occur. The other thing, obviously, the key kind of aspect is ideology. We'll get to that in a second, though. Um, closely linked to hysteria is also fear, right? Um, we have to have a hysteria, right? You need something to be afraid of, something that's causing you to act in the way you are. Um, in this case, we have that quote from the very start of the text, right? There are wheels within wheels and fires within fires or whatever it is, something like that. Um, in that same way, the levels of fear and hysteria act. Um, so a fear of the devil, of the religion, but of your reputation being ruined, of consequences, a fear of others. There are different levels of fear that all build up and bubble over much like a crucible or a pot, hey? Um, hysteria is spreading throughout the characters rapidly as everyone feeds off each other. We have initially this fear of the devil possessing people, but then it becomes a fear of the consequences of claiming something like this. And then it becomes a fear of your reputation being ruined because someone you know is consorting with the devil. Those types of things. And it builds up rapidly and there's kind of no escape for it, for the town. Um, this is a really essential theme. You'll probably, you don't have to have actually a paragraph on this one. It might be your over, overarching theme. It could be attached to your thesis if you'd like. Um, but on the whole, a really important thing. With the exception of ideology, it kind of overruns everything. <coughs> Sorry, everyone. Religion is the reason for everything in this text. However, as we demonstrated by characters like Paris, it's not just religion as an individual thing that is the reason why things are happening. Power is generally the underlying reason. Uh, Paris wants to keep controlling his parish because it gives him power. Abigail is able to manipulate her religion because she has no power. Um, all these types of things, uh, hail, um, hail, for instance, 
um, him investigating things is for religion, but it's also because he has the power to do so. So again, much like with fear and hysteria, there are wheels within wheels here. Um, and it is this theme, power has different meanings, right? Abigail wants power over her circumstances uh, and power within her interactions. Paris wants to maintain power over the town and the ideology that he is meant to be in control of. Um, people want to break free from that ideology. So power is really key. It's not just about power existing, but what people will do to gain power or to maintain power. So as I said, Paris is kind of a very, very key character there, as is Abigail. They're kind of the two for this one. Um, Abigail is kind of key for everything, um, but for power, she might come up more. You might choose to write about more, her more in the agency section if you choose to do something like that. Uh, but power is kind of an essential. You, it's the motivator, basically, uh, and reputation, but we'll get to that in a bit. Now, moving on to what I think is probably the most important theme, or at least the theme that if you're going to pick one is going to just run through your whole essay. You don't want to do a paragraph on ideology. This is just the theme, right? This is the crucible is about ideology. Um, overtly, the crucible is about religious society, obviously. But because Miller is hoping for this to be an allegory, he wants this message to extend to his current day audience. The ideology he's attacking is just ideologies as a whole, but in his case, more precisely, anti-communist ideology. Um, he wants to emphasize a lack of social rigidity. He's fine with there being some rules, obviously, but he doesn't want there to be this notion of if you have, if you've transgressed, you're gone. You're gone from society, basically. He is um, really highlighting the fact that some people who are deemed to be undesirable in society are not so. And therefore, if ideology is going to do that, well, we need to really call into question that ideology itself. As I said, it's the overarching theme. Everything goes back to how ideologies can be manipulated. Ideologies can be manipulated to spread fear. Ideologies can grow fear and hysteria. Uh, power is derived from the ideology at the heart of this society. Um, ideology, in short, I've said it so many times, it's starting to lose meaning, um, is almost like the social universal truth. Um, if a town is centered around a belief and then that belief can be manipulated then society can be manipulated. So Miller is warning that there needs to be some sort of disconnect between ideology and society. They can't just be wholeheartedly connected all the time. So obviously we see that in the Crucible, right? Uh, if the town was a little bit less, not even less religious, but less basing their politics on religion, probably don't care about witches as a whole. Miller's case, uh, it's the anti-communism or the un-American un-Americanness of communism. So if we've attached American society to anti-communism, anyone that does something is now anti-American, um, which is a bit problematic because then we can redefine what society is, you know? Um, okay, no one can be in a union anymore because that's communist, etc., etc. Intolerance is also a really good theme. A lot of the time um, it doesn't get used as a theme or you see it in summaries it doesn't come up but I think it's kind of very important to note um, it is directly linked to ideology as most of them are but it's intolerance as a theme is all about the lack of care or the dismissal of individuals who fail to fit in with society basically um, we have a clear depiction of intolerance and it's generally those who society was intolerant towards who either wield power um, and create chaos or who have the bad consequences happen to them, basically. Um, so Miller is saying... I don't think I did apple, but that's fine. Um, Miller is saying that... Um, People who are intolerant, we're intolerant towards, Abigail, the girls, are going to potentially give us payback at a point. 
The other thing that, you know, Mil uh, not Miller, Proctor is seen as a, a bit of an outlier. Um, that's problematic. He's seen also as the good man. So Miller is prompting the audience towards unity. He says that we cannot be like this, the idea that we have to conform and anyone who doesn't conform is kicked out because that's not going to work because at a point you're basically all going to eat each other. He's saying we can't do this. Um, we also have reputation as a key theme. Um, very closely linked with power. Uh, as a lack of reputation will lead to a lack of power. But we also have a gain in reputation, right? Um, you know, Abigail is seen to be a more bastion of the community because she gains power. So they're quite close together. Um, but there's difference between, say, respect and integrity and reputation. Um, so there's almost two types. There's positive reputation, negative representation, or negative and positive implementations of representation, maybe, hey? Um, Proctor doesn't want to gain power from the stereo, right? But he still has that big moment where he doesn't want to give away his name. He doesn't want to give away integrity. In short, how people perceive each other is one of the cruxes of Salem society. Without this absolutely a uh, tinderbox of people who are bickering, uh, people who are trying to gain power but have to be coerced by the ideology, it is all falling apart. We then also have gender, class and agency, uh, which are often forgotten when discussing the text. Um, it's a more critical analysis rather than just taking um, themes at face value. We're looking at why are certain characters behaving the way they are. Um, but beyond just what Miller describes. So this is what when I was talking about gender and Abigail, right? Uh, why does Abigail have to do what she does? Obviously, she's a bad person. But why does she behave in that exact way? Um, in short, the issue is that all the accusers, the girls, Abigail, even Tichiba, um, are given a level of agency, a level of power over their own lives once they become an accuser, once they become involved in this plot, basically. Abigail has more power than she's ever had. We see how that how Mary Warren responds to that. She also finally has power. Tichiba, after being an actual slave and probably being treated very, very poorly, and we know that because she's threatened with a whipping, is now God's instrument, right? She's so important. She's no longer just our slave. Um, so this, and when I say this, it can be a bit more of a critical analysis. That doesn't mean you don't get to talk about this in your essay. One of my paragraphs was about agency and about Miller's basically warning of depriving people of agency. It goes a bit back to intolerance, right? Um, if you treat people badly or do not give them control over their lives, they're going to want to seize control in some way. And we see that in this text. People achieve agency and are able to gain control. And that also explains why Abigail keeps it going for so long. Uh, yes, she's scared. Um, yes, she's scared of being found out. But also she's finally got power over her own life, which is a big deal. Okay, moving on to language features. Um, I'm going to go off on a tiny bit of a tangent for a moment because the thing with the crucible is that it is a visual text. I know it seems a bit odd to consider it that way when you are very clearly reading it in class. Uh, most of you probably haven't unfortunately had the opportunity to go and see the crucible. Uh, you may have watched the movie. Uh, movies are quite different I always find to a play. Um, the reason that's so important to keep in mind is that it means the cruci crucible the crucible is a visual text it is about um it is being performed to an audience which means its communication is a lot more direct to an extent and i'll get to that to an extent in a second but think about being in the 50s and watching this play what's your uh, interpretation going to be, right? Like, how is that going to differ from someone that maybe um, doesn't see this text and, and reads it instead? 
Um, you're going to, it's going to be a lot less emotional. You're not necessarily going to get the same um, sound experience. So we'll get to that with the stage directions. Um, but to have an accessible analysis of the crucible, you have to include these play specific techniques. You need to be discussing stage directions. You need to be discussing uh, character descriptions or locations. You need to be discussing the way Miller has constructed his play, which is in a very unique way, being more of a hybrid play, because he's got that authorial commentary that runs throughout it. Um, yes, line by line analysis is good. Like we'll look at some examples in a second where I have very clearly gone the metaphor in blah or whatever. That's totally valid. But in every paragraph, you need to have at least one play specific technique. Um, and that's if you've got three quotes. If you've got four quotes in a paragraph, which should be your goal, two or two, one or two, depending. Um, without that, you cannot do well at the Crucible because you are not analysing the form correctly. This is a play that is all about being a play. It is an allegory, it's a story, it's not meant to just be read. So you need to incorporate the other types of text, basically. Okay, this is the to an extent bit of the play. Miller is being a bit weird, right? He, it's a play, but especially towards the start, you have these bits where he jumps in and it's like, a word about so-and-so, let me just tell you about what I'm trying to do here. And he straight up tells you, Hey, I, this is why I'm writing this. Hey, by the way, I'm saying this is like Cold War America. Hey, by the way, this is like what they do, the commies. He's very, very overt. His purpose is not exactly hidden, especially within the first act. Um, this makes it very, very unique. It's just, a, it's instead of just a play with an allegory, it is now a hybridized text. Um, which is something you should definitely mention in your introduction and quite frankly in the rest of your essays. Um, for, I think, to be successful at the Crucible and to have a good, I guess, reading experience, you must be analysing authorial intrusion once per paragraph. So add in then a use of stage directions, etc. There you go. There's two out of four quotes for every paragraph kind of designated already. This is an essential aspect of the Crucible. Uh, without it, as I said, you won't be as successful because Miller has made a very deliberate choice to publish his play with these notes in mind. He could have just written them and then been taken out. There could be multiple copies of the Crucible. You know, you could be selling a normal one and then an author's edition or something. There is one version. It's got this in there. You need to, one, read it. If you're reading the Crucible and you skipped it, go back and reread. And two, talk about it. Talk about, you know, this plainly demonstrates Miller's context as he highlights X, Y, and Z. Allegory. The other key aspect of the Crucible, um, which makes it a commentary rather than just a play depicting a pretty horrific time. Yeah? Um, it is a as I said, an elevation of the play. So an allegory, what it does is say, this is like this, but we're going to compare it to something. We're making a commentary on something, basically. So an allegory um, turns something from being just a story into being a representation of something. So for those in New South Wales, hearing the word representation should prick your ears because you know that's a key aspect of your... Uh, of your rubric. So an allegory, again, is going to be something you discuss frequently. Now that doesn't mean you say the allegory shows blah, like you don't have to use allegory as a technique. Allegory should be listed as a part of the form, I would say, um, in your introduction. But the allegory is the representation, right? How can text represent human experiences? Miller is using an allegory to represent the human experiences of fear, power and intolerance. As I said, because an allegory is about that representation aspect, it means you need to have an understanding of both layers of context. So what is going on in Salem about Puritanism, 
about, um, you know, about uh, religion, about that type of intolerance, about the witches. But you also need to therefore have nuanced detail about McCarthyism because one without the other won't make sense. If you just talk about communism without saying, you know, this is meant to represent communism or anti-communism, it's not going to make sense. And also just talking about religion isn't necessarily going to make sense. He wants to teach the audience through doing this, basically. So you can think of it as a bit didactic. Uh, the play is based in reality and the um, text is obviously to an extent real. It's a true story. But he's made choices in order to teach the audience better um, and also potentially absolve himself because I'm not sure how much Abigail having an affair really teaches people, but that's okay. Okay, finally, as I kind of mentioned, stage directions. Uh, it is a visual text and you have to use the commentary that Miller has provided from the authorial perspective, but also the stage directions and the settings. Settings? Settings. Uh, they communicate Miller's vision for the performance, right? The actors would have read his notes and then you can go, okay, cool. Um, this is what he wants me to portray. Without that, it doesn't really make sense, hey? Um, so other than that, they provide really key moments of characterization that can't be communicated verbally. You know, when... Um, Abigail first walks in, you know, she has a, uh, something, you know, she's a dissembler. We get told that before she even opens her mouth, right? Um, we also can see that through the directions at the end of each act. We start off with the cacophonous noise of all the girls saying, I saw so-and-so with the devil. Um, we have the end of act three, which is uh, Elizabeth kind of crying as John's grabbed away I can't remember the act end of act two and end of act four is you know when John's going to be put to death as sunrise comes up and there's that line about like like bones rattling in the morning air as the drums build um so noise is also essential reading that and ignoring that isn't going to get that across um so just like the authorial intrusion you have to analyze stage directions and these ad similarly adjacent techniques Okay, I'm going to stop for four minutes just so I can rest my voice for a second. We're going to get into in practice. Um, yeah, I'll start from the beginning. And we're going to walk through my an intro, a body paragraph, and a conclusion. And these are from my trials at the end of year 12. I got 20 out of 20. Um, don't stress. If you can't do this straight away, you shouldn't. I mean, if you can do it straight away, oh my God. But, you know, if you read this and go, I can't do that, don't worry. Uh, if you want to, have a quick flick through the slides now, but I'm just going to rest for five minutes um, and then we'll get back into it.
Okay, let's have a look at some examples. So this question was something like, uh, you know, the power of uh, the role of a storyteller is not to answer questions, but give the audience ideas to think on or something like that. Um, something like that. It's a famous quote by Brandon Sanderson. Um, and then it was, to what extent is this true of your prescribed text? So this is my introduction. As I said, written during trials, I took out one thing, which is where I said, uh, instead of saying manipulate his Cold War era, I think I said his 1960s audience. And the teacher was like, question mark, question mark, question mark. Just had a mind slip. Didn't impact me, but you know, we all make mistakes, hey? So in this intro, and for those of you, uh, you'll all be at Edidi's, hopefully English Advanced Lecture, those of you in New South Wales tonight. I was going to say I've got a little essay writing course tonight for an hour, but you should go to English instead. Um, let's have a look. Let's start. This is my answer to the question. No, that's not an answer to the question. That's a body paragraph. Um, this is my answer to the question here. So this is my thesis. Texts allow for the challenging of traditional ideas. So it was about, you know, to what, you know, does a storyteller challenge you basically, right? A storyteller inviting the audience to question and critically reflect upon their own world. So here's my, um, you know, my link to the question. Storyteller, right? Um, and question. Now, what you'll notice here in this intro is that I've immediately come out of the gate talking about, uh, what the audience is getting out of this. Uh, the reason for that is because in uh, especially human experiences, but in general in English, your goal is to talk about... Oh, uh, let me just check. Um, sorry about that, everyone. I'm just keeping on track of the questions. Um, text allow... We, in a essay in general, but particularly for those in New South Wales who are doing the human experience, it as a unit is all about representations. Now, what does that mean? It means that the author has constructed something to represent an idea. It is all about how representations, how text can represent the human experience. Now, what is the human experience for those of you in New South Wales? That's a very loaded question. It effectively is stuff we experience in society. For an author to represent something, he needs to have some sort of inkling of one, what that is, two, some opinion on it, right? In the end, it is him putting a mirror up to his society and saying, I am representing an idea for a reason. That reason is, we see it, you know, uh, challenge, paradoxes, whatever, 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 right? Putting it out there so that the audience can respond. So in this case, I've immediately started with the crux of the human experience. Here's the audience, right? Then I move on to my expanded part of the thesis. Um, or more correctly, my introduction of the text, which I think is green to me. Um, so Arthur Miller's The Crucible provides exactly this with Miller's allegorical dramatic exploration so there's the form a dramatic allegory of the Salem witch trials some context Oop, that was a horrific line I feel I'm too late uh, being used to directly comment on his Cold War American context second bit of context prompting his audience to challenge the representations in the story that manifest in their own world challenge the audience is about the question, but also we've got that key representation word, right? And again, their own world. Um, then we move on to introducing the body paragraphs, which I think I've made blue in my mind. Um, through the lens of his allegory, I'm really nailing it, primarily because the question was about storytelling, and that implies some type of story, in this case, the allegory, right? That's about form. Miller represents, <laughs> we've got it again, the manipulation of authority is one. The detrimental impacts of social intolerance is two. That's my second body paragraph. The perverse nature of hysteria is number three. Questioning their continuing prevalence. So that's again the question that was in the question. Thus, through his storytelling, 
Miller, this is not, this is purple because it's my link back to the question. So through his storytelling, linking back to the question, Miller provokes the audience to think upon questions of lingering tradition explored in his text. It's not the best, lingering tradition is a bit of a cop out. Um, but on the whole, you can see I um, have broken down the question. I'm nailing storytelling, representation, allegory, questions. I've clearly outlined my body paragraphs and I've clearly introduced context. That's what you need to do. When you're introducing a text, I think there's four things. I'll list them and if four is not the correct number, I'll let you know. What the author's name is, what the form of the text is, some context and the purpose. Now, context is often seen as like the year it was published. You can do that, but it's not the end of the world if you do not include that for whatever reason. In practice, this is the body paragraph. I'm going to read this through once and then I'm going to go back probably because it's a bit complicated. Um, Miller exposes the perverse nature of centralised power. So that's my first, my first theme. Through his use of conversationalist authorial commentary. I don't think that's my introduction sentence, but that's fine. Um, immediately revealing, no it is, that's the form. So I'm bringing in form because I'm talking about allegory. It was about storytelling, etc. Through his use of conversationalist authorial commentary, immediately revealing his purpose in the allegory of Salem. Why has he done this? There we go. We've got his purpose. To expose political policy being accredited with moral right. It's a bit of a long sentence, but when you're writing an exam, you're not thinking about that. Directly highlighting to readers his desire to confront the audience. Um, thus, Miller too aspires to manipulate his Cold War era audience against traditional power structures. Um, so against traditional power structures is probably my second point there. Uh, through his text, evident further in the emphasis Miller, so emphasis being the technique there, um, Miller has Paris place on his ministry at stake over his daughter's very life. So there's the quote. In doing so, Miller attempts to expose authority figures, purpose, and their desire to manipulate theocratic values in order to gain personal benefits, so power. Highlighting the potential expense of ignorance towards greater social issues. Such manipulation of ideology, there we go. So we've now got our kind of second point here. Um, so maybe that's number one. It's kind of 1.5. This kind of could also be, okay, so, you know, his desire to confront the audience maybe is like 0 0.5. It's kind of half an argument. It's the authorial commentary, so it's a bit hard to analyze because it's just Miller straight up going, hey, this is bad. Uh, in doing so, Miller attempts to really blah, blah, blah. Manipulation of ideology is sustained, so two, that's not a Z, I promise, uh, with the subverted biblical illusion, so that's our technique. So it's not just an illusion, it's not just a biblical illusion, it's subverted. So we're getting a bit funky, right? In which Abigail threatens to come to the girls in the black of some terrible night and bring a reckoning. Oh, sure, no problem. Coming right now. This directly reflects... Uh, this directly reflects Miller's experiences with un-American activities. I'm not being very colourful because I can't bother to be un-American activities. Context. And prompts the audience to recognise purpose. Such versions of ideology motivated by maintaining and strengthening social power. Go back to the theme. As the play unfolds and the social degradation of Salem is portrayed. So, i.e. Um... That's number three there. Oh, I've already done number, no, I've done number three. Uh, as the player falls, the social degradation, so social degradation is a result of power, manipulation of power, in the final pages, firmly asserts his own motivations for such a text, again, purpose, using his authorial intrusion once again, another reference to that, I've repeated a technique, because it's not the end of the world, to reveal for all intents and purposes, the power of theocracy in Massachusetts was broken. Um, such a commentary is undoubtedly ironic. There's my second technique because I kind of felt bad repeating myself. Um, and acts as a dire warning to the audience. There's our purpose. Suggesting that the only way for modern America to be free from the constraints of centralised authority is to undergo social erosion. That's, I guess, the warning to the audience there. 
ultimately prompting against further development of seemingly autocratic power structures. So we're taking it back to the modern audience. Now, what you may have noticed, I'm going to write it on this. Oh, actually, this might be a bad idea. I'm going to try. So we have idea. Oh, God. God, that's horrific. I'm so sorry. Quote. Just hang on, everyone. I'm just shutting the door. I know we're getting down, but I'm sure you're all about to hear a, a whippersnipper blasting. Give me two seconds. is not the best ambiance for a lecture so you have idea quote that's going to be technique oh my god that's horrific writing explain <laughs> it's getting worse um explain and then you go audience Aud -e plus Plus, either context, purpose, <laughs> or uh, context, purpose, Author, I think is it, but I can't remember. Mainly context or purpose. Modern, maybe? Ah, interpretation. Either interpretation or action, basically. What that means is what does the audience feel compelled to do? Now, why is that different from this? Uh, it is because the quote technique explain audience is, you know, is this bit, right? The, um, the use of, let me see, here we go. Uh, subverted biblical illusion, Abigail threatens, that's the explain. The audience, well, now I've got context, but the audience is, uh, it highlights subversions of ideology motiv mo motivated by maintaining and strengthening social power. Then the audience bit will be about a dire warning. So they're slightly different. I admit that's not the best paragraph to use in as an example because it's quite complicated. Um, but it's kind of your representation of like the best you can be, right? Um, if you attend the English lecture this afternoon, I believe you will see this in a very colourful way. Um, and i.e. it's been broken down a little bit more. Let me just check that, Jan 2023. Chemistry, prelim canon, business. <coughs> Hang on. Inguang, that's not. There we go, English advanced lecture. Let me just see if it's still very colourful. In which case, I would recommend you attend just to see it broken down a little bit more effectively because it's a bit confusing otherwise, hey. Then we go to our conclusion. Conclusion, super easy, although I go a little bit silly from here onwards. It's a bit, it's a bit aggressive, but I was really feeling myself during trials. I was very much like, I'm nailing this essay. Um, conclusively, Miller's allegorical representation of Salem, we go back to the form and the question, allows readers to critically draw connections, again readers was key to the question, between Salem and the modern world. I'm kind of expanding a bit here. Uh, while initially intended for Cold War America to challenge centralised authority and intolerance and hysteria, Miller's text through its ability to pose challenges to and questions of the audience has remained contextually relevant, prompting the audience to take action in their own tumultuous context. 
So, I have another paragraph. But I'm going to answer some questions. But you can see kind of how these paragraphs are broken down. This is my uh, intolerance paragraph, which I do quite love a lot. Um, let me see. If we have. May not, and that's okay. Okay. It is not my paragraph anymore. Ah, oh, rip. Alas, my alas, it is not in the uh, the advanced lecture, which is fine. Um. If you come to my essay, then we'll be a bit more of a colourful example, but there's no stress, don't worry. Um, it's pretty straightforward. It's not pretty straightforward. I don't want to minimise. It's a hard essay to read. It's very intense. Uh, have a go at reading this and breaking it down yourself. Go through and see if you can find, like, where's the quote, where's the technique, where's the context, etc. I think this... I'd say this paragraph is a bit more straightforward, but it's gets a bit spicy from here onwards where it gets into a bit of a character analysis of Proctor. But in the meantime,